uh, Professor Christian Gessinger is, uh, is I would say, one of the most famous NMR spectroscopists globally. Uh, he studied uh, for his PhD in Germany and then postdoctoral research in ETH Zurich with a Nobel laureate in the field, uh, Richard Arms, following which at, uh, he was appointed a professor at University of Frankfurt uh, when he was 28 or 29. Okay. So that is a time when many people uh, do not finish their change. So, and then after uh, 12 years, he, uh, he moved to as a director of Max Planck Institute for Biophysical Chemistry. Uh, again, one of the leading laboratories. Uh, since then, uh, Professor Gressinger has been uh, uh, has been has influenced the field tremendously. He has been awarded with a number of prizes: uh, Sommerfeld Prize, Leibniz Prize, Bayer Prize. Very recently, Ampere Prize in 2014, uh, European Research Center at Grant in 2008. One thing that is, uh, I should mention that Professor Ratzinger has been uh, coming to India yearly at least once since 2000. Since 2000. Uh, so uh, he has really mentored a number of Indian scientists in academia and industry. I mean, of course, he has a number of students in uh, Europe, in US, and in India. He has also mentored some of the institutes in India and some of the scientific societies in India. So, project is Yeah, thank you so much for the two kind introductions uh, to this W and was it two? <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, so, let me, let me start with the, with the lecture. Oops. Uh, yeah. Um, uh, with which, which I gave the title in a spectroscopy chemistry and biology with applications in protein, uh, protein medication and low equity. Uh, I will give a little bit of the introduction because I understand that most of you don't know exactly what a spectroscopy is. Uh, nevertheless, there were two talks I think in December by Kerry Dark and Ari Asanari on uh, on mass spectroscopy. So maybe you had the chance to attend some of them. So I give nevertheless the introduction, then I will uh, talk a little bit about small molecules and that's one signal, fluid generation, and then also for protein recognition is kind of slow count. It's okay, I, I can offer any with the So um, this is the place where um, we are working. This is the place where countries of the sciences we have been used with an institute for experimental medicine. So, so now we are also with physics, so the chemistry, biology, and medicine have a very broad uh, range of uh, topics. At the moment, I think there are 15 departments. Now, if you look into this uh, hall here, then, then one sees the array of NMR spectrometers that we had until 2020, 950 megahertz was the highest field. Uh, but since uh, uh, June 2020, with the delivery of the 140 gigahertz, we should have now we have highest fields that is commercially available presently um, worldwide. And that instrument um, is quenched after six weeks of operation. And so that we have to recharge it or go ahead and recharge it again. Uh, but since then it is run perfectly. And we show you also in the end uh, uh, one, one example of a, of a project where this was really um, essential. Now, um, NMR spectroscopy, or the output of magnetic resonance uh, is uh, allows to investigate structures uh, and also dynamics of molecules in other physiological environments. Uh, it does not have to cool down like microscopy. does not have to uh, uh, crystallize uh, like uh, X-ray crystallography. Um, and, and therefore it has this kind of advantage uh, that it is more physiological, um, especially as it uh, can be done at room temperature or whatever ambient temperature that uh, molecules like to be in. 
um, uh, and, uh, why are we interested in structures? Well, this is kind of a credo uh, that such a biology is have, and such a chemist as well, that biology function is implemented by the actions of molecules, the knowledge of their structure, and their interconversion. So now to design modification of biological function, and this goes then into therapy and diagnosis. And, and one of the topics actually goes exactly into this direction here as well. Now, what you see here is a peptide protein complex, which uh, we saw it almost 20 years ago, uh, or more than 20 years ago, uh, by a mass spectroscopy. This is called moduli. Uh, it's a calcium um, sensor uh, in, in, in all the cells. Uh, it uh, binds uh, in each of the domains to calcium, and then it can recognize peptides, um, uh, which are most of the time um, recognized uh, in transmembrane proteins or so, for example. Uh, that then open up uh, or close down calcium channels. Uh, and this binding then displaces this peptide from the, from the transmembrane uh, protein, which then opens or closes uh, these uh, channels. Now, um, uh, how do we do that? Well, NMR spectroscopy comes in uh, two flavors. Um, one is the interaction, that is the investigation in solution, uh, where uh, one has a uh, uh, so solution here in a tube, uh, which has a diameter of five millimeter or three millimeter or even down to 1.7 millimeter. Um, and this means something like 250 or 50 or uh, 30 microliters or so fit uh, into this uh, the tube. Um, and this means that one uh, normally looks at uh, quantities in the milligram or microgram um, range. And um, the other um, and, and the other uh, topic or the other way of doing it is uh, with a solid state in our spectroscopy, in which um, one emulates the, the, the motion that happens with molecules in solution, which normally have rotational diffusion or Brownian diffusion, or you know Brownian motion probably, but Brownian motion normally is seen as translational, but it has also the rotational and for, uh, for in our spectroscopy. The rotation is the more important one. Um, and this happens uh, for such molecules here on the nanosecond time scale. However, if uh, molecules are solid, for example, because they are really large or they are found in membranes, then one would like to kind of emulate this, um, uh, this solution behavior. And this one does by magic ankle sample spinning. Uh, and depending on the rotor uh, size, one can spin them faster and faster. So this uh, smallest one is 0.7 millimeter rotor, which one can spin up to 110 kilohertz. If you compare that with the speed of an ultra centrifuge, then ultra centrifuge is um, like a picture. While the uh, MAS rotor here is like the, the rocket that we were looking at uh, this morning, not at launch, but <laughs> when it has maximum speed uh, coming. Into the, uh, into the orbit uh, around um, Earth. So this is really, really fast. It's only limited by the speed of um, sound, uh, because when we go beyond speed of sound, sound then it's not a laminar flow anymore. So some people are experimenting actually with helium, because helium in helium, I mean, if, if you ever inhale helium, then your voice sound is much higher, so the speed of sound is higher. And therefore, one could actually spin that with helium much faster, but helium is so expensive that nobody can really afford it. Uh, but if one would recover the helium uh, uh, efficiently uh, that was used for spinning, then in principle, one would gain uh, another full effect of two or so in the spinning without going down in the, in the volume. <laughs> now, uh, why, are we, why is nuclear magnetic resonance so powerful? Um, it is powerful compared to fluorescence microscopy, where you attach a dye somewhere in the molecule and then you know some behavior at this point. But we have our spies more or less everywhere in the molecule, namely the nuclear hydrogen nucleus, carbon nucleus, nitrogen nucleus, and in principle also oxygen. Uh, the only problem with oxygen is that it is um, that those uh, isotopes which are uh, magnetically active, you cannot really be used because they have a spin that is larger than one half. We like to use it only spin one half because they do not have this as the problem is the electric quadrupole. Everything that is beyond spin one half has an electric quadrupole and that makes lines broad. And we like narrow lines, and therefore uh, oxygen um, seven 
team uh, has, I think, spent seven out of five hours or so. It's, it's so important that it can not really be, be, be used. And some, some people are trying it, but I, I think it will have very limited application for biomolecular studies. So um, and now if one uh, and, and thinks we have the bottle, the carbon and the nitrogen, so that's in principle all the atoms that we need uh, for amino acids except for the oxygen. Um, and uh, of course, uh, the protein is, is uh, built from uh, amino acids, and these amino acids uh, here, for example, the nitrogen, the protein, the carbon, the side chain, also carbon here, the carbon, and so on. So, principally, we have importance at every position of the. Um, so this is depicted here again with this uh, carbonyl peptide complex. Here are all the protons which are uh, attached. And you see, I mean, we have our reporters uh, that are necessary or useful for them uh, everywhere. And uh, uh, if you look at the, at the hydrogen, then of course it has the nucleus and the, the electron. Of course, from the carbon comes another electron, such that we do not have um, um, sing single electrons, which would be paramagnetic. Most of our molecules are diamagnetic. Uh, and, and so, so this electron is just this very simple core oxidation. So, um, and uh, then of course the, the nucleus uh, we have here, it has this electron, but we are interested in nuclear magnetic, and the magnetism comes from the eigen rotation of the nucleus, uh, which is called the spin, and the spin is the shaving of power, and we can use this um, uh, nucleus. <clears throat> now, the spin one half has a property. Uh, so it's a quantized property. So, so the spin can either be oriented uh, if we have an external magnetic field, which we call V0, and we, uh, we uh, position it along the z axis, uh, then it can be either uh, parallel to the, uh, the spin can rotate either such that the magnetic moment is parallel to the V0 field or anti parallel. These are the two states. No other states are given. Of course, this is very different from. Um, a magnetic needle or so, which you can put in any orientation with respect to the magnetic field, but this is not possible with the spins, and this is because of quantum physics. So the, the preferred state is actually the one in which it is parallel, and the not preferred or less preferred state is which in which it is anti-parallel. So we have two energy levels, and whenever we have two energy levels, then we can use electromagnetic radiation in order to transfer between these two levels. Um, this is the absorbed or um, the emission, and that's of course spectroscopy. Whenever there are energy level differences, then these can be investigated by spectroscopy. So we need the big magnet here. Um, at the time, there was a 900 megahertz magnet, and um, uh, I come to this resonance frequency, which is this 100 um, in a second. Um, so um, what, what happens when, uh, due to the fact that we have this preferred orientation over the not preferred uh, orientation is that more of the nuclei actually go with the uh, V0 field according to the Boltzmann distribution. Um, and, and so we have an overpopulation of the preferred orientation over the less preferred orientation. And this leads to the so-called macroscopic magnetization, which is depicted here in red. Which aligns with the V0 field. So that's an induced magnetization due to this uh, overpopulation uh, of the so called alpha state, which is this one here, of the beta state, which is now covered by the uh, by the tube. And um, <clears throat> this we can then use, or actually the first ones to use it in this way were Richard Ernst and Weston Anderson. Uh, both are dead in the meantime. Uh, Richard Ernst died last. 2020, 2021, and only a few months later, also Weston Anderson uh, died. They were both um, uh, work colleagues at Varian Associates, Varian, which produced NMR instruments up until about uh, 15 years ago, but then gave up and was sold to NMR, was sold to Agilent, but then Agilent also gave up. So that's why Varian uh, is no longer there, although they had 90% of the market share uh, in, at the start of. Uh, of commercialization of the mass spectroscopy in the 60s and 70s and so on. So these two people um, came up with the idea to use this um, uh, macroscopic magnetization and to rotate it by a pulse, which is radi radiation uh, uh, during a certain limited amount of time, such that this magnetization will be rotated to the so-called transverse plane. So 
So that's the longitudinal long if you want the z direction and then here we have the x y plane is a transverse plane and um, this is shown hopefully in place in this two picture so it, it it goes down with the transverse axis and then when the pulse is stopped it starts processing and this possession uh, of the vaccination can be recorded and here you see the x component and here you see the y component of this uh, processing vaccination and at the same time, it decays. And that's why um, this recording is also called the free induction decay, because there's no pulse, that's why it's free induction, because the, pole, the mechanism behind the recording is uh, induction. It's uh, induction law, Faraday induction law, that uh, it uses a kernel in the coil because there's a magnetization that is rotating. Um, and uh, decay, because there's relaxation, which actually kills this magnetization after a certain amount of time. At the same time, while the transverse magnetization, the X and Y components are kind of decaying, uh, there's also recovery of that magnetization with another process, which is called longitudinal relaxation. Here we have transverse relaxation, here we have longitudinal relaxation, which allows to repeat the experiment after a certain waiting time, which depends on the recovery time of the magnetization, and then one can repeat the experiment. The two poles is the, re the relaxation back to equilibrium and this decay they are totally independent from each other. They are, they are different relaxation um, mechanisms and um, um, relaxation mechanisms. Now, this, uh, this is what we record, this free induction decay. And um, this is uh, also shown um, here again uh, on, a, on a bigger molecule. If we have, instead of only one spin, if we have many spins, for example, from such a holding, then we get a more complicated uh, FID, which then is fully transformed to yield uh, a spectrum. Uh, let me see here. I, guess, uh, I don't have the full transformation, but full transformation uh, looks maybe a little bit complicated, but in the so like formulae, more complicated like formulae. So, uh, but um, we are an analog Fourier transform uh, every. Second, so when I talk to you, then you do in your ear and your brain, you do the analog Fourier transformation because what I said to you is more or less a pre induction decay. Uh, I mean, it's something that is depending on, on time, but you don't hear that. It, it's not a time signal, but it's a, it's a frequency because if I speak in a low voice or in a high voice, then you immediately see that as a frequency. So, so the ear is nothing else than a Fourier transformer. And, and so this Fourier transformation is, is very simply explained. It just extracts all the frequencies together with the intensities from a time dependent signal. Now, you see that uh, depending uh, on the number of protons or number of hydrogens that we have, for example, this molecule here, the number of lines becomes uh, very large. Um, and uh, um, then we have so many lines, it's due to the fact that. Uh, the, the different uh, nuclei, the different uh, hydrogens, all have slightly different chemical environment, and therefore they have slightly different chemical shifts. They have slightly different frequencies uh, uh, where they uh, resonate, and this leads to this dispersion of the spectrum over about uh, 10 or here it's about 11 uh, ppm. 11 ppm is 11 parts per million. Uh, so the resonance uh, here would be, for example, 900 megahertz, and then 10 ppm is uh, um, um, 900 uh, ppm is parts per million megahertz. is also 10 to the six. This is a million, so it's 900 times 11. So that's about 10 kilohertz uh, width here in hertz, uh, in which uh, all these resonances here um, appear. Now um, this means that um, the uh, and, and, and this, uh, this uh, ppm value, for example, if we measure at 1.2 kilohertz, then 11 ppm would be 13 kilohertz instead of 10 kilohertz. And if we measure at 400 megahertz, it would be just 4,400 hertz. So, um, assuming that the line width of these resonances stays more or less the same, the dispersion, or meaning the, the chances of overlap, is much lower if we have a higher field. So that's why every biological air mass spectroscopist likes to work at the highest speed possible. That's why we have paid, for example, 12.5 million for the 1.2 gigahertz. Uh, maybe not rupees, unfortunately, but uh, 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 euros uh, for the 1.2 gigahertz instrument. 
Still, the question, of course, is if we want to relate uh, molecular properties uh, of such a molecule you know, with these resonances, there's a big, op or a big thing that we have to do, namely, we have to assign. We have to know which resonance here, for example, if it's look here, uh, detail, for example, here we have a resonance that, that is one hydrogen atom, most probably attached to an hydrogen. But we have to know which of the 148 amino acids that we have here belongs to this resonance here. Then we can uh, translate uh, any property of this resonance to that specific amino acid or to that specific atom. If we don't know that, then uh, uh, we cannot do anything. Now, uh, initially, people were uh, looking at um, very separate elements. For example, Friedrich started out as a histidine spectroscopy. That's because histidines are not so common in proteins, maybe one or two, and they have resonances which are pretty um, separated from the rest, so you study histidines. But this is, of course, not true. So it is like fluorescent spectroscopy where you look at certain things, but you want to look at the whole thing. So you need to assign all the resonances. And uh, in principle, that, that is um, the same as uh, here we have, uh, for example, ethanol, which we were um, uh, appreciating yesterday evening <laughs> quite a bit. Of course, makes you water, unfortunately, more fortunately. Here we have pure ethanol. Uh, so, so this is, of course, it's, it's a molecule that has a CH2 group, it has two CH2 group, and then H. And here you see a spectrum that was recorded in the 1950s. Uh, so the quality is, is very bad, but one sees here uh, one resonance, another resonance, and another resonance. And already from the integral, one can tell, I mean, this is probably the smallest, this is a little bit bigger, and this is even bigger. So, um, and then knowing that the number of photons that contribute to a signal is reflected in the integral of the signal, we can immediately assign, can tell, okay, this signal must belong to the method group, this, this signal to the methylene group, and this signal here to the voltage group. Uh, so the answer here of assignment is as simple as to answer the question, who of the two is the dumb one and who is the fat one? Well, we both look dumb, but uh, at least this guy here is fat. <laughs> yeah, so, so in terms of the assignment problem here is solved very simply, as simply as the assignment problem is. But what to do if we have, I mean, really many, many overlapping things. And um, the, the, the thing is, is, is similar a little bit to, um, uh, to a teacher here. Uh, he sits in front of a class out of two people. Um, actually, they are in a storybook by Wilhelm Busch. I probably tell them negatively here. Yeah. But uh, they are very, very famous in Germany. And um, they are. Uh, uh, Make a lot of fuss with, with all their lives. It's killed. Finally, they also get killed, and that's all about from what they did in a fairy tale uh, way. And their name is um, Max and Moritz. And of course, the teacher would ask, I mean, who is Max and who is Moritz? It's also the assignment the name to the face. Uh, now, you see here, we have a class of, um, of, of people, so, so many more, similar to our protein, where we have now faces. Uh, and, and names. And we have a teacher here, and she has not two words. I mean, so she somehow has found out how to do it. And actually, the, uh, the thing is, one cannot ask to the nucleus which amino acid do you belong to, but we can ask the question who is your neighbor? So we can make pair connections. So we, we can, uh, as we say, correlate one nucleus with another nucleus. And this is implemented by, implemented by certain NMR experiments. And this here is one NMR experiment. It's actually the first one, the so-called Cozy experiment, which correlates two nuclei uh, via um, a so-called screw bond coupling. And uh, the, this coupling only exists in, also in the bonding network. So chemically, they are neighbors to each other. And so if we translate such an experiment then to the screw class, uh, then we would um, uh, get the answers of always two individual kids say, okay, we live next to each other, but the so-called two-dimensional experiments don't give just the single answer here, one lives next to the other, but it gives the answer for all, all the people. 
Now, most of the time when we start working on a protein, we know the sequence. And um, regarding, for example, where they where they live, uh, where where each of these faces is behind the door, uh, we normally have the name tags on the name tags on the things. So, so here we, we can now say, I mean, uh, the, the two for the first two here, they live next to each other. So one here is Fox and then the next one is Moritz and so on. So we can move go through the whole thing. So um, here this is, is um, Max and Moritz. So we have to look on the line, name tag. So now we know this guy wants to live there and this guy is, is there and so on. So we can go through. And this we call sequential assignment. Yeah, so, so we can then by that uh, identify each nucleus. And, uh, and yeah. now, um, of course, this is uh, done in a slightly more sophisticated way uh, in, uh, in in proteins where we use uh, carbons uh, as well as nitrogens as well as holding resonances. And we use these neighbor relationships, for example, uh, through the through the coupling. Through this, Support coupling by going from a proton to a nitrogen to a C alpha and to a, carb uh, to a carbon. And so we correlate these four nuclei with each other and then get a peak, or actually in this case, two peaks uh, in which the proton, the nitrogen, and the C alpha um, is, is correlated in the so called three dimensional experiment. Um, and another peak in which we see beta in the nitrogen and the proton are correlated with each other. And uh, this, of course, is, is now not uh, good uh, in the way of, of going through this uh, molecule. We, we need another experiment, and this experiment supports sequence ACOH, in which we go from the C beta to the C alpha via the carbon to the nitrogen. And uh, the, the pulse sequences behind uh, all that, the modulation of the nuclei, uh, um, allows to direct uh, these parties either from the C alpha. From the C beta and the C alpha to the carbon and the bottom of the next amino acid, or it goes actually to the uh, to its own amino acid. So this is then the design of the pulse sequences, which allow uh, the proteins correlations. And um, this then yields uh, three-dimensional spectra. Here's one of these, and uh, oops. something. And and uh, here's some examples in which. Uh, one can get that go through and get the assignment. Now, once one has the assignment, one uh, puts that together um, uh, with um, um, st uh, structure carrying parameters. And there are plus with these parameters here. I don't want to spell them out all, but uh, the most important, and, and this is the one that I'm showing, what is the uh, NOE or the so called nuclear overhauser enhancement? It's a, it's a way to measure distances between. Uh, protons, uh, and it's shown uh, here. So we have uh, two protons which have a distance that is not larger than five angstroms. Uh, then, then one can measure it in the so called uh, nosy experiment, nuclear overhaul and enhanced spectroscopy experiment. Um, and as you can see, um, there's quite some overlap, uh, even in the two dimensional spectrum. I showed you the overlap in the one dimensional spectrum, but even the two dimensional. But if one then goes to three dimensions, then one can nicely see that the overlap can be, uh, can be solved. And uh, all these peaks that can be assigned to it, certain distances or photons uh, in the point. And uh, this, this process, I mean, um, uh, people are, are working on re automating uh, this process. And one can say now that uh, up to something like 20 kilodalton uh, proteins, so it's something like 200 acid control. Can be done more or less automatically. Uh, um, uh, this this uh, disposal signing and then also structure calculations. Now um, this is uh, what one that gets out. I mean, uh, each of these NOEs gives a certain distance, and then uh, since we measure something like maybe a thousand of these NOEs, uh, we get then a thousand of these uh, so-called distance restraints. Uh, so these distances have to be fulfilled in the final structure. And then one teams up with the theory uh, guys who do molecular dynamics and ask them to introduce these experimental restraints in the structure calculation. And, uh, and then uh, here, for example, from the extended chain, uh, from which one from the extended chain from which one can start, uh, one then gets um, the full structure uh, 
呃的的这边企业的那个呃呃 summary of such a collection. Now one can look at many uh, different uh, molecules in this in this way, and um, this is just a summary of molecules that we have looked at uh, over the years. For example, here's a um, transmembrane uh, protein. Um, it sits in the outer microbial membrane. Uh, it's called voltage-dependent anion channel. Uh, it's a protein that uh, has 19 strands in a beta bell that. Uh, that leaves the pore open, which is uh, occluded by this uh, helix, which is actually binding to half of the of the bell, um, and uh, uh, so so that structure here was at the time uh, solved by animal spectroscopy. There was that also an X-ray structure, um, but uh, it was done in actually there were three structures: one only animal that was the least uh, results, then uh, we had one by the amount of X-ray that was uh, much better, and then there was a, another structure that was just X-ray, and that was, one has to say, it was the latest, <laughs> it was also the best. So uh, uh, X-ray at the time uh, beat uh, NMR spectroscopy, especially uh, regarding this, this helix, um, yeah, I mean, the, the general code and so on, it was clear, but there was a key with this helix, which uh, NMR spectroscopy did not see. Um, this is another example here of a, a, a peptide protein uh, complex. Um, I will talk a little bit about this um, transmembrane sensor here in a second. It's uh, ATM ubiquity, which uh, is our um, object of investigation uh, when it comes to dynamics, because um, a lot of times when one looks at structures in textbooks or in publications, because a publication cannot show a movie, uh, one doesn't see that these molecules are actually dynamic. And um, this actually can be nicely revealed by NMR spectroscopy, X-ray and IOM are a little bit blind uh, regarding the, the, the dynamics, but NMR spectroscopy is very good at that. And uh, I will show you also at the end uh, uh, some examples towards, towards that. Now, uh, this transformation uh, protein is uh, out of a two-component system, CIT A, a citrate. Uh, sensor, and I will come to that uh, in a second. And this is another uh, a large assembly which uh, could be solved by uh, uh, solid state and a mass spectroscopy, maybe uh, a type two, a type three secretion needle, uh, which play a role, for example, in uh, pests and uh, other uh, nasty uh, diseases. Uh, these are um, Tubes from which virulent specters are ejected from the bacteria into their host cells. And um, if these tubes would not form, then they would not be um, infectious. Uh, uh, so uh, it would be a nice target, for example, to try to prevent such um, an infection. Uh, yeah, examples. Uh, but let me just go to this. Uh, uh, I mean, maybe one example here is. This, uh, so quite nice is phase separation. So one can look at um, intrinsically disordered proteins, <coughs> which do phase separation. 30% of the expressed proteins are disordered, um, and they can therefore not be studied by chiron or, or by extracosurgery, but they can be studied by NMR spectroscopy and some of the proteins droplets, so that uh, uh, um, membrane less uh, organelles. Uh, and uh, those have been the focus uh, of, of biologists since approximately 15 years. Now, let me go a little bit to this, uh, um, to this uh, sensor here. Um, and in principle, now I'm summarizing in something like five slides or so the work that uh, was going on for something like 25 years. So it's, uh, it was really a very challenging project. Uh, and the, the project was challenging because, for example, here these. Uh, um, this uh, so called periplasmic domains was not known what it was. So, so we, we saw it at the time in 2003, the first time uh, the structure of, of this periplasmic sensory domain, uh, which turned out to be a past domain. So it was a physical code that was known before. Um, and this past domain actually um, exists in the off state, uh, but then also in the on state when the citrate, which is the vector molecule, is found. And what one can see with NMR spectroscopy is then a 
compare the two states with each other and uh, one can look at the off state and one can look at the on state. Um, and um, by a combination of X ray crystallography and NMR spectroscopy, you can see that um, when the citrate is found in the on state and it is hanged uh, um, by uh, structure, is first extended and then it, it folds up and forms uh, like a half closed hand. Uh, and when that happens, then uh, this better strand here is shortened, uh, and uh, this uh, uh, disordered region here is folded to an ultra helix. One can uh, uh, translate that into a cartoon uh, that here the helix, uh, the, the better strand is really long, and uh, there's an ex uh, extended uh, um, but disordered region connecting and the transmitter helix uh, with this better strand. But in the on state, the helix is short, the better strand is shorter. And the helix is the formed here, and this fits all together to a shortening uh, of the distance between the, this, 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 uh, this uh, better slide here and this transfer value here, which leads to a pulling up of the transfer value helix uh, to into this uh, uh, pulling up into the kind of the water uh, interface here. So, when, when this transfer value helix um, is pulled up, then something on the subtropic side is happening. And actually, here the answer is already given. Uh, we have um, again um, uh, past domains here, and these past domains normally arrange, as is depicted here, it's depicted here, in this parallel fashion where the two helices are parallel to each other. But what we find, and I show you perspective from the evidence in a second, uh, is that um, in the off state they um, assemble in this anti parallel fashion, while in the on state they assemble in this parallel fashion. And what is the evidence to that? Well, um, also that took us really years of, of investigation. First, it was found that um, indeed these past domains can arrange in this anti parallel fashion. Um, and, um, but the spectroscopy was not good enough to really distinguish between these two states. And that's due to the fact that they are pretty dynamic and therefore a um, lot of resonance cannot be seen. But what we then did was uh, to uh, realize that the anti parallel arrangement, the C terminal of the past domains, have a distance of about uh, 45 angstroms, as it is depicted here, anti parallel, while in the, in the uh, on state of the parallel, um, they come together by about 11 angstroms. So, one needs then just a method in order to measure distances um, in this range between 45 and 11 angstroms. And there are quite a number, um, and there's fluorescence microscopy that will do that. Uh, but fluorescence dyes are pretty big. And indeed, we found that um, the, the um, activation of this uh, sensor is no longer possible when we use uh, such dyes. So there are smaller ones which can be used for EPR measurement, um, for the L or PR, but they were, this was also So the only one that was surviving was this so called codex label. Which is uh, just a fluorine. Fluorine is not natural in the molecule, so we just have one resonance in this, in this molecule. And, and although we have two sides, but the two sides are symmetric, so we have one resonance, and one can study the decay under so called codex conditions of this, of this resonance. And one sees um, that in the, uh, in the bound state, uh, it goes uh, down to about one half. And that's exactly expected if one has two sides, because um, then the signal goes to one over the number of sides, so one over two, so it goes to half. Um, while for the free form, it does not decay. Um, there's a little decay to the skin, and this little decay comes from the fact that we have always something like 25% of bound state in our sample. So we can see from this measurement here now, uh, clearly that in one state, the whole state, we have a large distance, and in the other state, we have small distance. So, um, such um, conformational um, um, interchange uh, can be studied with animal spectroscopy. And this is summarized here. Um, so, we have this pass, uh, 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 pass domain in the offset and the on state. Uh, we uh, uh, pull. Uh, pull it up uh, in the one state, so this P helix um, is forming uh, the transfer rate helix two is, is pulled up. There's some reorganization on this side, but the main thing is uh, most probably that um, now 
um, um, in the offset, the, 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 the distance between these two uh, sites here must be fortified also about four kilometers, fortified by rainstorms. And um, the, the, when the transfer helix is pulled up, the distance is just not sufficient anymore to keep it in this anti parallel form. So then it switches to the parallel form. And uh, so, in principle, it's, it's probably um, uh, just that the lasso is made a little bit shorter, and then um, the, the, the dimer rearranges from the anti parallel to the parallel. There's very little uh, uh, thermodynamic uh, difference between uh, the two. Now, um, I have a little bit of small molecules because um, India has, of course, a lot of uh, biodiversity and makes a lot of small molecules. Um, and uh, one topic that we are also doing together with Nilamuni uh, Nat, who is now at Guwahati University, is to look at small molecules. And they have not only, uh, are not only characterized by constitution, but also by configuration. And uh, here one sees um, a molecule with a lot of stereo centers uh, here as well. But I mean, if one looks at such complex molecules, then most of the time, if one looks how their uh, configuration is confirmed, is by chemical synthesis. Um, and of course, it would be in, a, in the, the eyes of an analytical chemist, and a much more complicated analytical tool. Of course, this is a sin that one has to go and in the lab do whatever. 40 reactions and at the end find out how oh, they synthesized a lot of configuration. Yeah, so it really would be nice to know before what I'm going to synthesize and to use it as confirmation. Although we had an example uh, on a very small molecule where five syntheses seem to have confirmed the configuration, but they all did a mistake in their uh, serious selective synthesis and came uh, out with the wrong uh, configuration. And uh, so then uh, there, there was actually an X-ray study, study which everybody had overlooked uh, for and, and we could then confirm if indeed that all these synthesis had to uh, had led to the wrong uh, assignment of the configuration. So although synthesis by the organic chemist is always described as the gold standard, never believe the gold standard. Mm -hmm. I mean, if there are other methods, then uh, be critical. So. Um, what, what we are using um, is so called dipolar couplings. Uh, I mentioned the through bond couplings, the so called J coupling, but there's also through space uh, couplings, which for example exist between the carbon and the proton. And uh, they lead to dipolar couplings, uh, provided uh, that one creates somehow um, elliptical uh, cavities. And uh, let me show that. Um, um, by a very simple um, uh, analysis. Let's assume a molecule is, is almost like a stick, uh, and if you put it in such an elliptical uh, cavity, then again, for Boltzmann, without any interaction of the molecule with the, with the wall here, uh, in such an elliptical cavity, one would assume that the number of possibilities uh, and the number of states uh, this arrangement can uh, adopt is given by the length of this um, line, uh, this red line. While if the molecule turns around, it's now 90 degrees rotated, uh, then one sees that uh, due to the fact that it will push in the wall here and, and here as well, the, the length of the line is, is less. So this means that the probability to be oriented in this uh, fashion is higher than to be oriented in this fashion. And this means that our molecules are no longer isotropically distributed, but anisotropically. If they are anisotropically distributed, then anisotropic parameters like the dipolar coupling can be, uh, can be seen. And uh, they measure in principle the, uh, the angle uh, here, such a vector between two molecular two, two nuclei is showing the angle between um, this vector here and the so called alignment frame. Now, how do we do such alignment? Uh, we, we can easily do that by making gels. Uh, here you see, for example, um, such a gel. It's, it's just in order to see it a little bit better. It's if the dye is put in, and uh, we have tubes which have um, a uh, inner radius uh, which is um, either smaller or larger. And so, by pushing the same gel from one side to another side, uh, we can uh, manipulate the ellipticity of these cavities. 
and by that then manipulate also the size of these residual library accounts. And from those we can get uh, information about the uh, configuration of such molecules. And here, for example, is one that uh, was isolated at the later here from Yucatan Peninsula in Mexico from Viario as Betino, uh, which is uh, and so they, they isolated this molecule and from uh, conventional analysis using the OZ and so on, we had four configurations that were possible. But then using these uh, residual uh, parameters, um, which one can measure, they can do more densities, as you know, one could then um, correlate them uh, with the best configuration and by that then exclude the three, exclude the three, uh, and only one configuration uh, was set. And this was uh, remarkably done with 35 micrograms uh, of, of uh, substance. And normally, if one goes into the forest and leaves into whatever the sea or so, a few 10 micrograms are normally can be isolated. And so, by, by uh, using this methodology, one can, uh, if one has zero centers, one can define uh, the relative and uh, also the absolute configuration. Uh, of these um, uh, of these molecules, and uh, this was um, a, a paper just published uh, twenty twenty, uh, where we used uh, this methodology with uh, which allows to um, at least very small uh, quantities. And in principle, um, this methodology is is possible. It does not really rely on super high field analysis on a regular instrument. One can do that um, a very um, routine. Now, um, I'm not sure how I'm doing this time. Okay, okay, I'm talking already about this now. Okay. Uh, okay. Uh, so, so well, then, then I have to skip a bit about it. But we'll stop with this. Uh, the last topic here was um, neurodegeneration. So, we are interested in neurodegeneration um, since uh, now exactly 20 years. We started in 2003. And this here is a video taken from the, and oh, this, this guy is talking, this is the video of this. Um, and I probably cannot switch it. So, so there's, it's just from YouTube, because there's a guy who's, who has uh, Parkinson's symptoms. And they affect, affect actually so-called dopamine and neurons in the substantia lipa. These are um, higher centers which um, make people move or give initiation uh, for yeah, movement, yeah. and you see in a second that this person can nicely walk when he has this initiation by the incentive of these white tiles on the floor. But if this yeah, goes yeah. on, then he yeah. cannot walk very nicely. But he just has this very short walk. And um, so, if he needs these incentives, I mean, some people actually um, use a laser pointer, so they they get a laser pointer and then they point in front of them, and then they can. Walk. So it's really, it's not that the uh, motor neurons are not affected, it's really the higher uh, uh, places in the brain. And in the last sequence, you will see uh, that if he swings both arms, uh, that then he, he has enough incentive from the swinging of the arms to then even go over this, uh, the white tiles, uh, stopping now he swings both arms, and then he can make a few steps. Now, um, uh, all, all this uh, uh, comes from the fact that these dopaminergic neurons uh, die, which are in the substantial lipa. Uh, and um, what is associated with that is always that alpha nucleus, which is a protein, is aggregated in form of baby proteins and baby provides. And uh, this is just one class of, uh, of diseases where alpha nucleus aggregates in Parkinson's disease. And also another one, which is just a bad protein. But there's Alzheimer's disease where two proteins, a beta and tau, uh, aggregate. There's Poisson-Jakob disease where iron protein aggregates. Uh, it's, it, this is not such a big disease as, as the others, but um, uh, these, these diseases are big. And then type 2 diabetes is even bigger. It's about 10 times more people are affected than, than uh, people by Alzheimer's disease. And there's also comorbidity. So, so if, if one has type 2 diabetes, then the probability to get Alzheimer's disease is also uh, heavily increased. 
Now, in all these cases, uh, proteins which are intrinsically disordered, so from the study by the mass spectroscopy, uh, aggregate uh, from monomer via uh, S1 disease, uh, mainly toxic monomers, then into uh, fibrils. And uh, this year is shown, uh, this year sh shows that this is exactly the same for, uh, for, for Chow. It's also um, in the monomer, it's intrinsically disordered, a little bit folded, uh, like uh, in between, and then in the fibril form, form so called cross beta sheet uh, structures. <laughs> and um, now um, the, the, we are we are working on a small molecule um, under the gene which blocks actually the transition to these toxic oligomers, which would then also prevent the formation of the fibrils. <laughs> and uh, here is a study from the animal model where one sees these uh, aggregates forming in the untreated or placebo treated mice compared here to the uh, to the mice that were treated with the uh, under the gene. Um, and what one sees is that. The depopulation of these oligomers, which one sees here, um, and these little dots here are um, considered by our operators as monomers and dimers. Uh, uh, so it seems that less of these uh, oligomers are formed when uh, this molecule is applied uh, to the mice. And we did this on, uh, we, we applied that on many, many molecules. Uh, so in many, many, many. many and it uses the use models, mouth models, uh, uh, with a small molecule. And see, in all of them, we depend on a um, protein or a beta or tau uh, or ion or also IPP. We see beneficial effects to these mice. That's why we uh, founded the company, Rodak, uh, 2013. Okay, now it's also 10 years that this company exists, which uh, two years ago teamed up with Teva, such that we are now. Not respected anymore with money to do clinical trials. And these are these are the way. Now, um, uh, this is just um, uh, one experiment here for um, Alzheimer. Uh, uh, what we did was, uh, I mean, not me, but actually collaborators. So the nice thing is that we have to just to convince people to treat uh, our public with the device and then do the experiments that they know how to do. For example, here, this is a water maze uh, test. For memory, mice uh, have memory, so they remember something. For example, if you put uh, um, on a swimming pool, you see the swimming pool, uh, you, you put uh, these visual cues, uh, and then you put a platform uh, at exactly a certain position, uh, then you can train the mice to find uh, this platform because the mice don't like to swim. And so if the mice memorizes where the platform was, it, it swims back very quickly. If the uh, mouse, however, has Alzheimer's and doesn't remember, it did not find the platform. So one measures the duration up until the mouse finds the platform. And uh, then there's another experiment in which one removes the platform and just looks where does the mice swim, mouse swim. Uh, and if the mouse mem memorizes where the platform should be, then it should swims there more, more of the time than in the other ones. But if it uh, does not memorize, it swims everywhere equally. And um, that's actually depicted here. So here, this is the, the placebo transgene. Uh, the placebo trial. This is the placebo where one sees that there's little difference between the uh, between the, the target ones and the others, the target both for others. While in the treated ones, one sees that um, there's a nice differentiation between the two, which is similar to the wild type mice. So these mice are not super smart. I mean, you and me will probably remember after one training session where the platform is, but the mice uh, don't. So one sees that one reproduces uh, the memory of the wild type of these treat under the uh, treated uh, mice. So, so these are the, experiment, the type of experiments um, one can do. And so what we did then uh, was to aggregate um, alpha-lutein in order now to get some structural information, uh, aggregate alpha-lutein 
uh, the membranes and look at structures. And um, uh, this is the guy who, uh, who did this uh, work like unfortunately. And he wants these um, then from cryo-M, the, the, the structure of the fiber that is formed in the presence of the lipids. Uh, he wants it's this protofile. Uh, so three of these protofibers come together and they are bridged actually by, by lipids. It's also the first time one, one saw that. Um, and then we were interested in, in looking at uh, where the other two get binds. And maybe I, I speak for the table of details, but just show you quickly where one sees now uh, from the years of this fiber. Uh, and in the second, you see the small molecule that sitting here is in this uh, tubular cavity and it is going up and down. And the reason that it's going up and down is, of course, because of the translation of symmetry, because this fiber is made from identical copies of the other three, which is sitting there. And therefore, whether it sits here or there, it doesn't really matter. So it's a, it's a specific binding, but in a way, it is not specific because it is going up and down. Uh, in this in this fiber. Um, uh, yeah, let's skip that. Uh, we are looking at, um, uh, I mean, the, the fiber, as I, I, I mentioned, is, is not really the most interesting species. Nevertheless, we are looking at it just to have uh, some, some reference actually for intermediates. And we are looking at these early forms, these toxic oligomers. Uh, and and uh, for example, here is intermediate that we can prepare in the presence of lipids. It's indeed toxic. You see a cell viability, and then what sees that this, this intermediate actually exerts toxicity. Um, and uh, we can do NMR spectroscopy uh, with it. And uh, this is the example that I want to show where one really sees uh, the benefit of our contributor instrument. I mean, the, the light width is reduced uh, by about 30%. Uh, here one sees it uh, as well, and, and that actually allows us to assign such spectra uh, um, to an extent that we can really tell how the structure looks like. And um, we are still in the in the works of um, doing that. Therefore, I cannot show you the structure. I will not show you the structure today, but probably within half a year or so, the bank that we will uh, have for the day to finish that and so hopefully get something we can publish it. So the, the, the goal here, or the hope slide uh, for this work is to, um, uh, to look at um, uh, Parkinson patients, but maybe also others. Uh, here, the hormonergic cells die. Um, and when 70% of them are dead, then one is normally diagnosed with Parkinson's disease. And uh, then you will get dopaminergic uh, therapy, so they get L-DOPA. Uh, which then um, allows to be functional uh, for another um, 10 years or something like that until, but the death of the neurons continues, and therefore, uh, at some point in time, this leads here to this to years, and then uh, life is really visible. Now, um, if one started treating with, um, uh, with, a, with a compound that would delay that, for example, by a factor of two, then one would uh, extend this uh, kind of pretty normal lifespan, uh, maybe by or 10 to 20 years or something like that. So that would be a huge benefit uh, to the affected uh, people. And of course, uh, due to the fact that there are prodromal uh, signs uh, of, of this, which, uh, which one can uh, see about 10 to 15 years before the onset of the disease, one could then start treating such people even uh, earlier and then see how yeah, uh, 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 now, uh, uh, just uh, one slide uh, that shows Guardian's work uh, is, is this one, <laughs> in which uh, this was really just a marginal problem uh, that we have been interested in also more than 20 years or so. How do two proteins recognize each other? Uh, and uh, one can um, study that by uh, for example, titrating in one molecule to the other. In this case, it was ubiquity and uh, SH3. So the SH3 concentration is here cranked up from 0 to like 80%. Uh, that was the maximum because of solubility. And one sees here that uh, indeed the complex is formed because uh, the resonances of the ubiquitin uh, are shifting uh, depending on the concentration. 
And um, then um, uh, one measures uh, certain relaxation phenomena. Uh, um, and together with the theory, theory of Thomas Weitel, uh, that was published first in time, uh, it was then possible to, to indeed identify confirmation selection uh, for the bias the binding mechanism compared to uh, two state binding or issues <laughs> bit, which are exactly the same. One would exclude these two and indicate here that confirmation selection is really prevailing. And this is uh, published uh, last year. And Talian, the, the main author uh, on this on this uh, publication, is sitting here. So whenever you have any questions regarding this topic, then just approach him because we have the expert on this work uh, sitting with the <clears throat> So uh, I'm I'm done. So let, let me uh, launch the last uh, topic. Uh, this, this is really a long work. We started 20 years ago. Uh, 20 years ago with Claudia Fernandez, who brought absolute clean and also um, small molecule, not the under the B, but for uh, the MI into the lab, and then we started working on that. Then in a big uh, center of, of excellence with many people uh, from the university, but also from my institute here, my colleague, colleague Herbert Jekle, Tom Jobin, uh, Gregor Eichel, uh, uh, Fischer, and, and other people. And, and then we uh, started collaborating with Armin Giese from the University of uh, Munich uh, and then founded the company and, and so on. Um, I mentioned the work uh, of uh, Leif Anderschlitt, uh, which is here. Then the sun is still in the Oliver, which I can tell something about soon. Uh, and Lohan Andreas is the group leader in the department who works with the solid state. So all the solid state scrums I was showing we are supervised um, by the uh, <coughs> dystopic uh, control there. And finally, on the seat A, uh, this, uh, these last experiments with the cortex, especially, were done by Siski uh, uh, again under Lohan Andreas' uh, supervision. And this is a long standing collaboration with what we do uh, for minds uh, on the, uh, the functionality, functionality of the different systems. And um, we also had uh, a nice collaboration with the rest of my microscopy on these things with uh, some of the from the MPI of light. Uh, so thank you very much. Uh, ah, and the last uh, topic, of course, here again, Kalyan, uh, one of the people uh, here, other one, uh, Reddy, and Sophia, <laughs> Matia, and Bogdan Lingin, and so, so the, all these people uh, were uh, essential for driving this topic to the point. And then we can send finally. Questions? So, Kalyan, eat the oxygen pure or after that? You look like a real child in that photograph. You look like a real child in that photograph. Shy. Oh, really, very young. Ah, young. Okay. 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 I, I, I think the beard makes it. Let me see this. Okay, other questions? This was more women, right? Good. Did you try anything with the small molecules uh, that alpha uh, silicin uh, uh, inhibition? Try any other molecules? Other molecules. Um, well, I mean, uh, we tried not only this one. I mean, this one was out of about 250 compounds that we had synthesized, which were in the class of molecules which were identified by a screen that our Lisa had done. And uh, that one was then the one that uh, had the most uh, active one in the animal models uh, that, we, that we did uh, in, the, in the beginning. I mean, Clinical development takes a long time. You cannot develop as an academic group, and then with some seed funding from biotech, the biotech company cannot fund um, looking at ten molecules at a time. Was um, uh, preclinical toxicology and, and all these things. I mean, they eat up about per molecule about two point five million, and uh, we were happy to have finance that. <laughs> And uh, in the 
here to shine spotlights. But still, this molecule is uh, for the front corner. So we could not even find uh, better ones in the meantime. The candy space, if you put the nugget, uh, I mean, it, it contains, as you have seen, the raw one. Uh, we can replace that by a chlorine. Uh, and that is that's still working, but um, was uh, and uh, also iodine does not work as well as iodine. It's can be uh, So yeah, we have tried many other molecules. I mean, there they, they, they are other molecules around. For example, cocomine. Yes. Uh, there is EGCG uh, and, and so on. All these molecules look very similar to to this one. Um, the point in these other molecules is that uh, they have no chance to reach the brain in sufficient concentrations. For example, cocomine, if you give it, give it at the same dose in carcinogen, in a mouse, which is uh, a factor of 10,000 less concentration in the brain. And that's due to the fact that it has free wage groups. Yeah. They, they are taken out by the liver, and and, uh, and, yeah. and, and then also, the, it's not so lipophilic, therefore, it does not go, go through the blood brain barrier so easily. Our molecule actually, uh, the, Blood brain barrier is not a barrier, but it's actually a vacuum cleaner. So the concentration of plasma is five times lower than the concentration uh, in, the, in the brain. Uh, so it's actually it's uh, it's going in there. Uh, it's it's not, it's not uh, accumulating there. So it's always in equilibrium with the, with the plasma. So when the plasma concentration goes down, the brain concentration goes down. But uh, um, it, it's it's I think this um, specific specific combination of uh, uh, bioavailability, um, metabolic stability uh, that this molecule makes. And I mean, a lot of people say um, oxidative stress. Yeah? So the cocomine and, and, and HCG or so are these antioxidants. Yeah? And, and antioxidants play some sort of role also in the regeneration. But this under 38E um, cannot be uh, oxidized because it's, it's chemically inert. And we have also looked uh, at least in mice whether we can uh, identify any metabolite in the brain uh, because there are slow concentration of people 450 molecules also in the, in the brain but we could not find we could not find uh, anything at least i mean not, not ever not a patient that we were sensitive to so it seems really that uh, the antioxidation role that one might also want to have is at least not necessary for the uh, efficacy uh, and um, I think it's also uh, explains very well why, although, for example, EGCG is um, at least similarly, well, if not a better, uh, intuitive for, for uh, aggregation in the vision of our community. You can forget it. I mean, there was an MSA trial actually uh, on the EGCG after we did the patient that was well, I mean, using it for toxicity. And uh, this, uh, I'm not sure any benefit. Yeah, people are trying maybe um, CNS drugs, right? You can avoid sleep cooking and whichever can cross the blood brain barrier and then try to mimic their structure and uh, try for uh, Alzheimer's. That's the kind of a research area uh, yeah, as a goal, right? Sure, sure. I mean, uh, principally, antibodies uh, might have a similar problem as well. They have a hard time to, to cross the blood brain barrier. Although uh, some people say, yeah, uh, maybe for your cost, the blood brain barrier is not so uh, tight anymore when one has a disease, because especially Alzheimer's is also associated a lot of times with some muscular yes. problems, and so the blood brain barrier is not as tight anymore as it is in yes. um, in healthy uh, at least micro strokes or so that are also in thought to be using. So there's certainly a cost talk. A lot of people that have Alzheimer's don't have, have not only Alzheimer's, but also some vascular. Uh, John? I have a very general and technical question. So I see that you, know, you have like, so many different like, frequencies of these NMR machines. And uh, so now that you've got your one and two gigahertz machine, is there any advantage? I'm I'm not I, I know it's like over you know, twelve million uh, twelve million followers, but is there any advantage with using a lower frequency machine uh, as compared to or why would you not all 
of it is just yeah, yeah, of, I mean, of course, uh, the book is there to have more than one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, 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 so, so I think one, one uh, <laughs> <laughs> but well, why, why do you have the law of this? Uh, in there are so, so, some experiments where you just don't need the right thing. And, and also then, then you go to a law of field, you have a simple law of you, uh, so that you can do. And there are, are some experiments uh, which involve, for example, Nuclei which have strong um, chem shift and isotropy. Chem shift and isotropy uh, goes uh, the, the, the forms the lines again quite with the zero field. And so, um, for example, if uh, experiments that involve carbon groups which have a large anisotropy um, are not the best to, to be done at one point to be with us. Uh, or um, phosphorus, if, if one is looking at uh, RNAs or so, then uh, phosphorus is also a huge. CSA, and uh, then it makes sense uh, to, to use a lot more the highest field. Then, for example, in Kalyan's case, I mean, uh, looking at the organization dispersion, and we looked at different fields. Uh, so, the, uh, the one field for certain questions is not sufficient to meet several fields. And, and that's, that's why it still makes sense even with the highest field to have a more field. Um, it's, it's always good to. Somehow build even with bones <laughs> and uh, uh, that, 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 that I think is, is the most uh, is, is, is the best. Of course, it's it's easier to get people uh, to get more people uh, But um, it's also good to have to, to go for for high field for these bio molecular um, molecular systems. Okay, there are no other questions, then we're thanking you for everything.